This is lecture 26 for ECE 402. And we're going to talk about musicians' filters today. Uh, in a past lecture, we talked about uh, musician sawtooth and uh, other such ideas. Well, here's a musician's low pass filter. And again, this is from the homework 10 topic. Uh, so I'm just talking about this some so that um, hopefully the homework assignment, uh, when you do it for next lecture, uh, will make more sense. So um, one of the first things I want you to notice when you look at this uh, graph here is look at the axes. Uh, the graph here has units, squared units, magnitude squared, or sometimes we call that power, uh, uh, for the vertical axis. And that's really different than most of the um, graphs we've looked at in the past, uh, for timbre anyway. We usually look at linear amplitude or linear magnitude, or sometimes, like at the bottom of this page, we use uh, decibels. But this is yet a different unit, uh, which is often used for musical filters, uh, namely uh, magnitude squared. So one of the uh, things here is if you want to uh, go to minus 3 dB, you have 10 log of a half is minus 3 dB. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, you know, wh why do you not see here 20 log? Well, that's because this half is power units. That's already a squared unit. So you don't have a 20 out here. If this were a linear unit, then you'd have the 20 out there. So uh, just something to keep in mind, keep the units in mind here. So this is magnitude uh, squared. On the horizontal axis here, we have radian frequency, and you're familiar with that from ECE 310. This is just normalized, so you don't have to worry about what the sample rate is. Uh, so this is uh, whatever this here pi, uh, that is uh, the half sample rate. And uh, so uh, here we have uh, uh, a low pass filter. Its cutoff frequency is at radian frequency one, but it's kind of a funny low-pass filter, right? So there's a bunch of ways how this differs from what you've seen in, in normal engineers, sort of EC310 style low-pass filter. First of all, it has a very weak cutoff slope. This is a very slow cutoff, especially considering we're just magnitude squared here. It's not like this is decibels on the vertical axis. So a very weak cutoff slope. And then the stop band here is not very far down from the... Uh, from one, from unity. So it's got a weak stop band. The other thing is it's a low pass filter. What, what is this bump here? It's got this mega resonance right at the uh, uh, cutoff. Now, in most of your low pass filters that you've studied in the past, uh, you're interested in things like maximally flat pass band. Well, this is certainly not maximally flat. It's got this big old resonance here. So uh, it's not at all near flat. And uh, then because it's such a wimpy filter, you know, you want to do minus 3 dB points. But minus 3 dB points are problematic when they don't exist. If the, cut -off, the filter doesn't even go to minus 3 dB, what do you do? Well, uh, so as you'll see in the paper, uh, one of the things you do with a filter like this, um, uh, with a musician's low pass filter like this, is just redefine what, the minus 3 dB points are, instead of using those to define bandwidth, you have uh, two points here, omega 1 and omega 2, and those are the half power excursion points. So what does that mean? That means on the left side here, uh, uh, it's um, halfway between the peak and, uh, and DC, and on the right side, it's halfway between the peak and uh, uh, the uh, stop band. So wherever uh, the magnitude, uh, uh, yeah, we're, we're, you know, we're, wherever the ma magnitude squared or the power, um, halfway power, I uh, mean, between those two things. So if you look at these formulas, that's all they are here, right? This is, uh, you, you're going to have a half here. You're comparing uh, at frequency omega one, which is here, minus DC divided by uh, this, uh, at this frequency here, uh, minus DC, and uh, uh, that should all equal one half. So that's just a formalization of what I said before of the half power excursion. Again, here you have the same thing at J pi here is at the half sample rate at the end of the stop band, 
and this is at the cut. So if you define uh, half power excursions like this, then you can define bandwidth in terms of half power excursions. Because again, our traditional definition of bandwidth is problematic when you don't even have minus three dB points because it's common in music to have filters that don't cut by three dB. They'll only cut by two dB or, or, or some smaller amount. Okay, so uh, just to play you uh, an example, I mean, it seems like, oh, these are such wimpy filters. What's the point? Well, actually, it turns out in nature, uh, wimpy filters are a rule of the day. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots of examples of uh, uh, acoustic sounds that are made uh, with quite wimpy filters. I want to play you a, uh, a nice uh, example here. Uh, why do I play this? I don't know, because it uses a resonant low-pass filter. Um, but it's also just sort of an interesting example. This is played uh, a, um, a piece inspired by the mouth bow. And since many of you might not know what the mouth bow is, I will show you uh, a very short example on YouTube um, uh, from uh, uh, Simon Winsay. Um, here we go. Let's see if I can move this over here. You can find this video yourself and watch the whole thing if you like. Uh, let's see here. Will my thing reach? Okay. Uh, almost, almost. Very close here. Okay, so I'm going to play a very short example. You can see the instrument here. It looks like a bow and arrow bow. Right? Uh, looks like an o bow and arrow bow. And um, some anthropologists are so positive about what humans are like that uh, some of them surmise that actually the uh, bow and arrow, you know, used for as a weapon, as a hunting tool, um, well, what came first was this musical instrument. And what you'll see is uh, he's moving, he's changing the shape of his mouth to change the timbre. And he's also moving uh, a, a stick along the string to get different pitches. And here, I'll, I'll just let you watch it for a few seconds. <laughs> So you can see, um, in this case, it's struck. There's also sometimes a, uh, the string will be struck. Uh, sometimes the string will even be uh, pulled more like uh, with a bow. There's all sorts of different ways to play this instrument. But you can see uh, uh, what it is. It doesn't have a huge pitch range. Um, so anyway, inspired by this instrument and uh, its possible lovely history, we have a sound example I want to play you here. Uh, Find this here. So this is a, a mouth string sound that you can find in the Eden Matrix if you look around. And uh, this is just played on continuum. So it's inspired by this instrument. It's, it's sort of uh, modeled on it. And again, uh, this is a typical sort of sound, uh, well, many, many different sounds, but uh, uh, using a uh, resident low pass filter. <laughs> So uh, that mouth bow sound that you can also try out um, on the continuum yourself if you like, uh, was inspired by a, a different way of playing the mouth bow than what I just showed on YouTube, uh, where the string is plucked. 
And then there is a, a filter that's like a, a formant filter for different mouth shapes that, that shape the sound differently. Um, this example isn't, you know, very realistically what an actual mouth bow would do because uh, the one this was inspired from can only play a couple of half steps range and uh, the synthetic version plays lots more, uh, uh, plays a much larger range. But anyway, um, um, it's inspired by, it's not a simulation of. Uh, so there you go. And there, uh, the formant filters, of course, are bandpass filters. Um, but again, uh, uh, with pretty weak cut. Um, and then, uh, then uh, yes. Uh, so, so a collection of, of uh, very weak filters, uh, no high order filters there. If you do want higher order filters, uh, there's some issue, you know, practical issues that um, I'd like to talk about. First of all, and this is important uh, for the reading, uh, it's very common to cascade filters in music. So it's common to have one pole filters or two pole filters. And then it's very common if you want a higher order filters to just cascade two pole filters. So what does that mean? Well, uh, for one thing, uh, you better have a filter that behaves well enough so, um, when it's cascaded. And uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that some. Uh, basically, it has to um, uh, be nicely transparent or the cascading is really going to, uh, uh, going to uh, hurt the sound. So <clears throat> if you cascade uh, filters, like here we have cutoff slopes uh, in the Egan matrix. This is just straight out of the Egan matrix user's guide, these pictures. Uh, these are high pass filters, uh, resonant filter. And now here the vertical axis is not power, this is dB. Um, but as you can see here, uh, this is a uh, 12 dB per octave cutoff slope, and this is much steeper. This is 48. Um, and uh, how are uh, this one here is just this one cascaded four times. Okay, so uh, this four times in a row gets you that. Now, um, uh, one thing that's, as a practical thing, if you're building a synthesizer or something, in the Egan matrix, we found that uh, if we use uh, the bandwidth B here, then if we cascade two of them, we use uh, um, B to the half power, B to the third for three of them, and B to the quarter power for bandwidth um, uh, for the, uh, if you have four in a row. Why is that? Well, when you increase the the number of cascaded filters, really to the user, it's nice if it sounds like the cutoff doesn't move. I mean, all they wanted is more of them cascaded. They don't want the cutoff frequency to move. And your perceived cutoff frequency is kind of interesting. Um, when you have a, uh, a single filter like this, uh, the cutoff right here is at the peak of the resonance. But when you have uh, uh, four, um, four of them cascaded, for it to sound the same to you, that the cutoff frequency is the same. I mean, the filter is going to sound different because it cuts stronger. Uh, this one here, but if you want the cutoff frequency to uh, sound the same, it actually turns out it's a bit to the left of peak here. And again, by doing this bandwidth adjustment, uh, we, we get the effect that uh, it sounds to a person using it that the cutoff frequency isn't jumping around as you're cascading filters. So just sort of a practical experience thing. There's another practical experience thing which I want to mention, uh, and that is uh, this uh, thing that you can find in the uh, Egan matrix also, and, and which came from analog uh, synthesizers, um, where uh, you can compute the filter coefficients once per millisecond. And that's the normal thing. The vast majority of filters that you'll see in any Egan matrix design are recomputed, uh, the coefficients are recomputed once a millisecond because the filter parameters just don't change that fast. Even if you're changing say the cutoff um, frequency for a high pass filter with an, with an envelope or with your finger or something, once per millisecond is plenty fast enough. But there is also this option to recompute the filter coefficients every sample interval. And uh, that's a pretty weird thing. Um, I would liken it to the FM. So in FM, remember if the modulator in, in uh, two operator FM or the simplest FM, one modulator, one carrier, um, in, in that two operator FM, if the modulator is at a very low frequency, then it sounds like a vibrato. 
And that's sort of like the normal way uh, to use uh, these filters, low pass, high pass, band pass filters, is to uh, have them changing the cutoff frequency very slowly. But in, in FM now, if you take the modulator and you make it at audio rate, so it's super fast, just as fast as, uh, uh, you, you know, it's not sub audio rate, but now so it's not a vibrato anymore, but then you get a timbre change. And the same kind of thing happens with filters. I mean, what does it even mean to change the cutoff frequency of low pass filter every sample? It's sort of a bizarre idea, but people did it and it was useful. And later on in this lecture, I will show you an example of uh, some beautiful music played that way. So um, again, if you want to analyze what that means uh, mathematically, well, good luck with that. It sounds good, um, but as far as I know, nobody's done a very thorough analysis of it. It's something that depends very much on the details of exactly how the filter is implemented. All right, so in this homework 10, uh, you're going to look at different filter to, uh, topologies. Uh, one of my favorite and sort of the, a mainstay of the Egan matrix, or at least for the modal filter sounds and for, yeah, and for the other uh, uh, filters we use, uh, the most common thing we use is called an RBJ filter. That's because uh, uh, um, Bristol Johnson put up a page, which you can chart and search for, RBJ filter, that gives you the coefficient formulas for low pass filter, high pass filter, shelving, notch, all sorts of different um, biquad filters gives you the coefficient formulas. And while anybody could derive those formulas, as, as he says, well, he derived them and he kept making mistakes and years later was still updating that page uh, for little mistakes he found. Uh, so if you go to that page, you'll get the correct formulas instead of uh, uh, munching through it. Because when you have in something incorrect, sometimes it's actually hard to tell, does this sound the way it's supposed to, or do I just have a bug? Uh, so um, uh, I, I strongly recommend if you want to make your own filters, um, and if uh, you can use a biquad, uh, uh, look up that page if you're programming something, uh, especially if you're doing floating point. This is quite easy. Uh, if you're doing fixed point, you have to be more careful. So the, the Egan matrix is all written on floating point um, on the Shark DSPs because it's a modern floating point DSP. Um, if you do fixed point math for your filters, you can do everything that you do in floating point. You just have to be more careful. One of the issues there is if these coefficients here, we got a B naught, B1, B2, um, minus A1 and minus A2 here. Uh, if those coefficients uh, get to be very large or very small in floating point, well, you don't care. In fixed point, you have to be careful that you have enough digits of accuracy uh, so that your, uh, uh, your results are still good. Okay, so in uh, the Egan matrix, uh, we have a modal filter bank. So we talked about modal modeling. Uh, we have a bunch of bandpass filters. So I'll talk about the bandpass filters in particular because modal filtering is a super important part of, uh, of uh, the Egan matrix and the sounds that people have actually made in it. So it's a, a physical modeling based thing um, from lecture 23. One of the things for efficient implementation of lots of resonances or lots of bandpass filters is, uh, uh, first of all, when you do a bandpass, this B1 coefficient is zero. So if you look on the left side here, uh, you don't even have a, a feedback thing uh, there. And secondly, this whole left side can be shared between all the resonances. So if X sub N is, is one of your uh, sounds, um, all the resonances that you're going to implement, that, that you're going to put that sound through, um, um, they can share this left side. So this part of the biquad doesn't even have to be computed individually. Uh, sometimes you only have eight resonances, uh, depending on your uh, modal design. Sometimes it'll be 40 or more. And so it's a very nice efficiency thing. This only has to be uh, implemented once. And this here uh, is implemented separately for each one. If you look at, um, if you're interested in the details, you can look back at uh, lecture seven. I gave some example shark code. If, if you're into DSP coding, uh, you can see that, yes, you know, this was each one of these uh, bandpass filters um, in a modal filter bank like this uh, were, uh, was implemented in one and a half instruction times. So very, very fast. Um, I'm gonna play you an example of uh, a lap steel example here. This is one, again, with several different filters in it. It has uh, modal filters for the string. It's also got uh, uh, 
filters in the feedback uh, loop, but uh, here, I will go ahead and play that for you. Uh, you can watch on this example, uh, on the screen it shows foot pedal control. It shows some of the foot pedal control, so there's not just playing, Ed is not just playing with his fingers, but he's also uh, controlling uh, parameters with his foot pedal. The uh, feedback energy here builds up slowly, but of course you have to be careful when you play this sort of thing to to not, uh, it, well, it's like any feedback uh, system. You have to be careful that you don't overload the, overload your system. Okay, so here we go. And we'll do another low-tech filming of another screen. All right, so there was an example of the uh, uh, modal filter bank in use. Uh, you've heard uh, many others throughout the semester. But uh, yeah, what else was I going to say about Look at my notes? Here. Well, uh, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I was going to tell you something else about that sound, but uh, in any case, if you're interested in this kind of code implementation, uh, you can uh, look uh, back at Lecture 7. Now, uh, there is another structure that is very popular in music and very well respected, which is uh, the state variable uh, structure. It was... Popular, uh, popularized by Chamberlain, so uh, they're also called Chamberlain filters. So what is special about the filter coefficients in this setup? Well, first of all, this setup is less efficient than if you do biquads. Like you have this odd thing here. Look, here's a sum, and here's a multiply, and here's another sum. Then there's a delay. 
but this kind of setup, you're not minimizing the number of multiplies. You're not minimizing the number of sums. Uh, what are you doing here? Well, the thing that's cool about this filter is that FC here, that is uh, uh, the cut frequency, that filter coefficient here and here only depends on the cut frequency and not on the bandwidth. And here, this here uh, depends only on the bandwidth or, or the um, Q uh, of the filter. So uh, it does not depend on the cutoff frequency. So it's really nice in many situations to keep these controls separate. If you change the Q of the filter or the, cut, uh, the bandwidth of the filter, you're only changing this coefficient, these stay the same as they were and vice versa. Also, uh, just as a comment here, you can get the high pass out of this. If you um, uh, read it out here, you get band pass here, uh, low pass there. So you can read the output out of different parts of the filter. Now this is very un unlike the, um, this kind of uh, biquad filter. In the biquad filter, all the coefficients depend on uh, cutoff and on frequency, uh, cutoff frequency and on bandwidth, and in a very uh, nonlinear, uh, complicated way. Uh, they're, they're combined together. So uh, this filter has uh, kind of a, um, that, that's kind of a cool feature. Another thing is it's transparent, uh, where transparency just means, uh, you'll see this in the homework, um, but transparency you'll see means that if you look at this as a digital filter, you've got an input coming in here. And let's say you have, I don't know, 16-bit uh, samples. Just by the fact that you have 16-bit samples, you're going to have some amount of noise in there. Why? Because, well, uh, your, 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 you know, your sample word size is, is going to limit the accuracy. So you're going to have noise due to the sample word size to have 16-bit samples. A transparent filter at the output will have no more noise in it. Nothing in here is going to add more noise than the noise that's already present just due to the 16-bit samples. So on the output here, uh, you're going to, the filter is transparent if all, the, all the, the noise floor that you see is due to 16-bit samples and not due to this processing. And uh, uh, so there's probably a better definition of that in the paper. Uh, I just sort of wanted to get the idea across. Now, another thing that's very important about transparency is uh, you're looking at, uh, th th you're comparing noise due to sample word size uh, has to be the limiting factor uh, and not, not this processing. And that has to be true for any sub range of frequency. So it's not just overall, uh, the overall noise uh, power has to be less than, the, uh, than that due to the um, uh, sample word size, but it also has to be in every sub range of frequency that has to be true. And that's very important because you wouldn't want a situation where you don't have very much noise, but it's all concentrated in one small frequency range. Uh, because for your hearing, you would definitely pick up on that. And uh, so uh, you can't cheat like that. And any sub part of the frequency range, any sub part of the frequency range you want to pick, uh, the noise always has to be due to, uh, limited by the uh, sample size. So you'll read more about that. Um, uh, there's lots of good things about this filter, but uh, there's also, you have to be careful. Like this paper you're reading, in my opinion, is one of the very best practical papers or sequence of papers. There's, uh, you'll see there's actually three of them in the course packet uh, by Totaro. Um, it's one of the, some of the best papers you'll ever find. Still, not everything is covered in these. And uh, uh, so there's lots of good properties that are discussed. But what I've found in using the Econ matrix, where you control this thing with your fingers, uh, this kind of uh, state variable filter has many problems and very many realistic synthesis situations. Um, basically, I run into trouble at anything above the quarter sample rate. So basically half the frequency range that you want to use, uh, you get problems because if you uh, can change FC or QC values slowly, everything is fine. But if you change them quickly, the filter uh, falls apart. So this filter cutoff modulation I was talking about before, where you're changing the cutoff frequency at audio rate, is just totally out of the question for this. But it's something that you can do with RBJ filters, which is boring old biquad filters, uh, without a problem. Uh, there's other little things that, that are uh, 
immensely important once you really start implementing these things and go for efficiency. One of the things I've just learned from experience is the RBJ filters or these biquad filters um, are really forgiving about stepwise changes. As long as, you know, your cutoff frequency stays within, uh, uh, you know, a, approximately the same frequency. But if, you know, once a millisecond, you want to update your coefficients, you can just stepwise update them once a millisecond. And as long as you don't have big coefficient changes, it's very forgiving and it actually behaves quite nicely. And it sounds like a gradual transition um, from one set of coefficients to the other, where for this, if you're changing coefficients at all, you always have to linear interpolate at every sample. You have to linear interpolate these coefficients, um, which again is, is uh, uh, makes this a much more expensive filter. Um, but uh, you can prove for, for uh, Biquad filters, and I've seen papers that prove it, that no, you can't just change filter coefficients uh, stepwise. But in my experience, in almost all practical situations, it's uh, it's not a problem. So um, anyway, so, so there's nice things about the uh, biquad filters. I do want to play you an example, just because I've talked about it, um, that uses this modulation of the cutoff frequency, you're changing the filter's cutoff frequency at audio rates. So you know, you're changing it continually during the period of the sound. Uh, and uh, it makes an interesting thing. So um, in, this, uh, in this little example, you're going to hear two different finger-controlled filter effects. The one is a high-pass uh, high filter that's slowly moving cutoff, with sort of a well-behaved, normal moving cutoff, and it gives you sort of a trumpet-like sound. The other filter you hear is low pass, which makes for a French horn-like sound. And so you'll hear a trumpet-like sound, French horn-like sound, but then you also hear this muted trombone-like sound. So uh, when this uh, low pass filter, if you start modulating its cutoff really quickly, it doesn't sound like a low pass anymore. In fact, it sort of makes this mute effect. Uh, that sounds like a muted, uh, uh, somewhat reminiscent of a muted trombone. So go ahead and uh, try to listen for that in the sound example. Or maybe not. Put it on here. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see here. Sound speakers. Turn this off. Back on again. One more time. When in doubt, reset everything. Well, bummer. Okay, that one's to work. Why can I hear the system beep but not the music? Okay. Um, here we go.
So I'll include. Um, I will include that uh, with the email I send you, uh, so you can uh, listen to it at higher quality. Uh, listen closely though for uh, uh, that effect of the uh, uh, muted trombone there of the uh, uh, audio rate modulation on that filter, and it's very neat. It, it's a very gradual change from the French horn like timbre to the muted trombone like timbre. It's actually very well behaved, even though you're doing a quite odd thing. All right, um, a couple more topics that are in the paper. Um, I want to talk about the all-pass lattice because it was talked about there. Um, again, in the paper, you're going to read a lot more about this. I just want to give you an overview. Uh, here's a um, second-order all-pass lattice. And trick question, what is its magnitude response? Well, it's all-pass, right? So its magnitude response is flat. Um, it's, it's just one. Um, then, what does the cutoff frequency, and this is radian frequency here, because that's the way the article is written, but uh, what does the cutoff frequency mean for an all-pass filter, right? If it's all the same magnitude response, well, okay, so the cutoff frequency, uh, that's where the phase activity is centered. So, for instance, if you look at this graph here, uh, this is uh, the phase response for this uh, all pass filter, and you can see here uh, omega c equals one is the cutoff, and that's where you can see that these uh, phase changes are centered there at the cutoff. What does the Q or the bandwidth mean? For, well, it means how steep is it, right? So here's a, uh, a, a steeper change and a less steep change, um, so lo uh, higher and lower bandwidth, uh, or um, lower and higher Q. Okay, so an all-pass filter is often used for fractional sample delay. Now, this is sort of a review, um, but actually I, I said in a previous lecture the Lagrange interpolator is often better. And why is that? It's because the phase response is better for the uh, Lagrange interpolator. The Lagrange interpolator is going to, uh, is going to be better at getting you uh, a, the same amount of delay across all different frequencies through the filter, right? And an all-pass filter... Well, often that's not what you want. Um, if you want a fractional sample delay, yeah, that, that's great. You want the same delay as, as much as possible. You want the same delay at all different frequent, uh, for all different frequencies. Um, but uh, the all-pass filter uh, is really good uh, if that's what you don't want, if you want to um, get some dispersion of the sound. So, um, yeah, so here's an all-pass phase response. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about then is, you know, why is this not as cool, this all-pass lattice structure? It, it's a nice structure, makes for good filters. Um, why is it not as cool as the Chamberlain filter? Well, one of the things is, uh, here you can see um, uh, the cutoff frequency uh, is related uh, here to uh, uh, this coefficient. And, um, but here, this coefficient depends both on cutoff and on Q and in a, in a kind of complicated way. So again, in the, in the uh, Chamberlain or the, uh, uh, in the state variable form, uh, you don't have that problem. Uh, the filter coefficients are really the parameters that you're interested in. They're based on the frequency. Uh, well, some are based on the cutoff frequency, others are based on the bandwidth and they're not mixed together like that. Um, one of the places where you sometimes want dispersion, you really put all-pass filters in uh, for dispersion, is uh, for, uh, or diffuse, uh, I'm sorry, for diffusion, all-pass diffusers. Um, you're purposely using the all-pass to delay some frequencies more than others and uh, to get the sound more diffuse. And um, so uh, uh, in... This other uh, part one of this uh, paper, uh, there is the first part, uh, or you know, the first part of this paper, which was not assigned for homework because I thought it was too much. But uh, look at part one of the paper if you're interested in reverb. This is a very famous older reverb, a lexicon reverb. This is the only place I've seen it described. And uh, in fact, what's inside the continuum was uh, based on that. Now, it's kind of funny because nowadays memory is cheap and people use convolution reverb or other reverbs that take a lot more memory. Um, but as you know, for the Egan matrix, I only use on-chip memory on those chips because that gets me huge memory bandwidth. And I don't go off-chip for memory at all. So I don't have very much memory. You know, 
on-chip memory is pretty limited. So it's funny, I go back to very old papers from distant past and try to find the best reverb that doesn't take much memory. Uh, anyway, the first part of this uh, paper that you're uh, reading today, the first part that's not assigned, has a 22 uh, kilosample reverb, which is really good. Now, because we have more modern development tools and we could mess with things more, we actually got that down to even uh, about half that many samples inside the uh, continuum. So the reverb inside the continuum sounds pretty good. It's, a, it's not a bad reverb, uh, or the recirculator, I should say, um, but it's, uh, uh, it was only possible because this paper was published and Dataro described in part one of this paper how they did it. If you're interested in reverbs, also check out the herb verb. That's another one that was based on this, but it's a granular version. I, I think it's fantastic. And it also comes as a module for, uh, uh, for uh, analog synthesizers. Okay, so here is a topology which uses this all-pass filter. Um, the all-pass filter in a bigger structure, you know, usually you do want to affect magnitude. This diffuser is a special case, but here you have an all-pass filter. And now this all-pass filter, if you take the original signal and the signal that went through the all-pass filter, and uh, then you add them together again, uh, or subtract them, then uh, you can get changes in magnitude response. And uh, this all-pass structure inside this regalia Mitra topology that's discussed in the paper is especially nice for making these notch filters, right? So you've got notch and boost filters. So you can uh, do a notch here. Um, why is this working? You know, wh wh what's going on here? Well, this all-pass filter here, if it something gets... Uh, 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 you know, if, if the delay through the all-pass filter uh, it makes 180 degrees phase shift at some frequency, it'll cancel out when you add it to the original. And uh, so, uh, well, that's the trick. So basically, you get the phase shift here. Uh, so here, at this point here, the magnitude response is still the same, but if you add it to the original, uh, you get uh, constructive and destructive interference in different parts of the spectrum and so you can get different responses. One of the reasons you want a uh, notch filter, well, a common thing to do is to have a notch filter right at 60 hertz, because you got 60 hertz hum you want to get rid of. And if you make it narrow enough, well, it gets rid of your 60 hertz hum quite nicely. Uh, so again, this is a way you could do it. And also, if you want a higher order filter, like before, you can cascade this. So, um, these Dataro papers, this is about all I'm going to say about this. You're going to read this for homework. Don't, don't want to do spoilers of everything in the homework. Um, but um, other topics of interest in these Dataro papers are not being uh, assigned. One is random noise. I mentioned this in the other uh, lecture. Uh, if you are going to generate random noise for, for some music uh, reason, uh, don't just use the C or C++ random noise generator. Uh, it's pretty low quality. Uh, check out the random noise part of this paper. That was very, very useful for me. Uh, there's reverberation part one of this. There's delay line modulation. So uh, again, for the reverberator and also for uh, various other techniques, um, it's really useful to have delay lines uh, which change length over time. Uh, and uh, there's a bunch of other topics here. There's also topics like, well, if you just want to make a sinusoidal oscillator and you're not particular about the phase, what's the most efficient way to do that? Um, lots of different very good topics in uh, those papers. So I strongly suggest uh, if this is of your interest or uh, that, that you take a look at that. Thank you very much.